Hi, Dennis. Uh, how are you? Thank you. Your policies. And so again, uh, those of you who are on the back, please feel free to take a seat. Uh, and so please try to hold your questions uh, and so that we can have the questions at the end of the Thank you. It's really nice to be in this session. Um, it's appropriate, actually, because what, what I'm going to be telling you about today is free will in leeches. <laughs> so, keep an eye out. Uh, the, I'm interested in how animals make choices. And the, here's the animal that I work on here. This is a leech in the bottom of a container. Um, the water level is about that deep, and if you poke him a little bit in the back, starts to crawl. So you've got a tail sucker and a head sucker, and they go, they do an inchworm crawling movement along the surface. If, in fact, you do the same thing to the same animal, but now you're in deeper water, the water level is up here, uh, what you see is that they tend to, they tend to swim. Um, Oops, he's saying, where's that water level? Oh yeah, it's deep enough. I can swim. <laughs> That's the swimming behavior, an undulatory up and down. So, so what's responsible for making these kinds of decisions? To decide to do one behavior over another. The one extreme, I'm going to give you two kinds of strategies that have been uh, discussed. One extreme is that to do a single behavior, you have sensory receptors that get processed, and then you have at the other end pattern generators that go in motor neurons producing behavior. And here in the middle are the decision makers. And the notion is that these cells for behavior A spend their whole life sitting there waiting for the right stimulus to come in. When this, the right stimulus is processed, they then put activity onto the pattern generators and you get out behavior A. These kinds of cells have been called a variety of names, uh, command neurons, command line neurons, command system. The, the notion is that these cells are the interface between sensory processing and, and pattern generators. And so these are the guys that are responsible for making decisions. And then if you want to do a separate behavior, a different behavior, B, you have to have a different set of decision makers. Now, there might be overlap in the sensory input and the sensory processing, but the notice, notion was that there are different decisions, uh, decision makers for each behavior. And to do any one of the behaviors, you have to turn off the other. So the, the notion was that, that you get behavior A, you have to turn off B and C and D and all the other behaviors. And then, likewise, if you want to do behavior C, you have to turn off A. So, this is quite simple. The cells in here do one thing. Uh, they turn on when you want to get to behavior. They, they turn off for all the other behaviors. There's actually a fair amount of data uh, in the literature, at least in the invertebrate literature, uh, suggesting that this is right. At the other extreme, you can imagine that all the cells, so cell X, cell Y, cell Z, or uh, group X, Y, Z, are sitting down in some rest state. And then if you give a stimulus, you move them all into some other state. In this case, it would be right out of swimming. So if all the cells are up and their activity goes into this state, there would be an attractor there. There would be a, uh, this behavior would stay on for some time. But you can imagine if you gave another kind of stimulus or possibly randomly, uh, it would go off in a different state and you would get, instead of swimming, you'd get cold. So this is a, everybody takes part in it different state of activity, so sort of dynamical systems. So which is true for the leech? Well, in order to look at this, we have to be able to record from his nervous system. Here are the two behaviors you saw, swimming. Uh, these are successive frames in a swim, so the animal is doing this, moving forward. This is one cycle of the undulation. It takes about one second to go through this whole thing. If you record from the nervous system in a given region uh, while this behavior is going on, when the animal, when this segment looks like this, the dorsal muscles are contracting, uh, the motor neurons to the dorsal muscles are firing a burst. You look later in the cycle when the, the, uh, the animal, the front end of the animal looks like this, the ventral motor neurons are bursting. 
And with each cycle, then you have an alternation between dorsal, ventral, dorsal, ventral. That activity wave moves back through the animal to get the undulation, but actually projected through the water. Um, the other behavior to look at is crawling. Crawling is this uh, extend out, lift, lift off the sucker, extend out, put the sucker down. So this is the elongation phase of the, the crawl. Contraction phase starts at the front, moves its way back. Uh, the animal lets go at the back sucker, moves it to there. That's it. One of the so the, the motor pattern that you see for these two behaviors are quite distinct, and that's that's nice because what we're going to do is record these behaviors in isolated nervous systems. We we can in fact get the same motor patterns from isolated um, nerve forms, like the whole central nervous system taken out of the animal. In fact, that's how these recordings were obtained. So I'm going to show you a bit about its uh, nervous system. Um, to make the points, uh, it has a ventral nerve cord. It's got a brain at the front end, a brain at the back end, the brain in the front is bigger than the brain in the back. Like some politicians, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are 21 segmental ganglia that all look pretty much the same. Uh, to give you an idea, this is what, what a ganglion really looks like. These round things are uh, the cell bodies. There are about 400 cells uh, in the ganglion. Um, they're bilaterally symmetric so that the cells on this side and the cells on that side are the same. So the unit within the nervous system, the unit of function is 200. And if you look from segment to segment, the ganglia look pretty much the same. So if you find a cell in here, you'll find it back there. I know that's true for this diagram because that's just a duplicate of that. So then, how, do you, how are we going to study decision making? Well, we do it by giving an ambiguous stimulus. We give a stimulus that produces a behavior, but sometimes it produces swimming, and sometimes it produces crawling. So the, the nervous system was taken out of the animal, from the head brain to the tail brain, record from the uh, stimulate in one of the segments, record the motor activity from another one, and then we're also going to do something a little fancy. We're going, to, we're going to do optical imaging so that we can record the activity of individual cells, a lot of them at once. But for the moment, uh, the idea is that we can stimulate the same place with exactly the same stimuli again and again. And in this case, so this is 12 seconds long. Uh, nothing was happening here. An electrical stimulus was given for a half second. And then the activity picked up. And then it became swimming. So we can tell that the swimming is taking place here. Wait three minutes uh, so everything settles down again. Get exactly the same stimulus. But now this time, instead of getting swimming, got crawling. This would repeat at about 10 second intervals. Right? So we, we can distinguish these two behaviors. We'd like to know what's going on in this animal's nervous system in this time when it's deciding, when it's making the decision to either swim or to crawl. Even so when does that take place? Sometimes during those times. Uh, this is to give you an idea that if you give this uh, stimulus again and again and again, uh, sometimes you get crawling, sometimes you get swimming. They tend to, to be random. We can't see a pattern in which it comes with which. And you can see there's some variability in the onset of the, uh, the swimming behavior and the onset of the crawling behavior, but they're distinguishable. All right. So, the way we're going to try to get into the nervous system to record from a lot of cells at once is to use some voltage sensitive dyes. And I, I can tell you more about the details of it, but basically you, you put the dye on the nervous system. This is a ganglion, looks about like that. This is about a quarter of the cells on that surface of the ganglion. You can see the cell bodies. And what was done was to draw circles around these images on the, on the, um, the digitized version of them. And everything within that circle got um, average, and then the average value was given to all the pixels within it. And when the cell depolarized, there was more fluorescence. When the cell hyperpolarized, there was less fluorescence. This was polarized, so depolarization is going to be yellow. Hyperpolarization is going to be yellow. And if we are real quiet, we can hear, we'll hear the bursting motor neuron bursting that is the dorsal burst. So, so the, when you hear a burst, that would mean that the animal is doing that. 
and then it relaxes and then it does that. So let's make That's the cell that's producing the bursts. So it goes yellow every time the burst goes. These three cells are in back of the dorsal muscles, so they're going together. So they're getting yellow and black together. This cell is out of phase because it's going to the ventral side. So you can see that these three are out of phase with that one. Some of these cells are in other phases. Some of the cells are firing but have no particular phase relationship to the behavior. But it's this kind of activity then, this kind of data that we're going to use to look at what cells are doing in um, the different behaviors. So in this case, there was activity recorded from 142 cells. So 142 circles were drawn. Um, the stimulus was given here. And in this case, swimming happened. Here are the 142 cells over time. Uh, in this case, the, the electrical signal, that, or the, the dye signal, that meant depolarization is going to be in red. Hyperpolarization is going to be in blue. So that you can see that this cell got excited at the beginning, slowed down, and then got excited again. Uh, all of the cells did something. But what we want to know is which cells it's something different between the two different behaviors. So these are the same cells in the same order over here, but now this time the, the stimulus led to crawling instead of to swimming. And you can see that there are some differences. If you look at any given cell, um, there are cells that are doing different things at different times. Now, to, uh, to, you know, now that we have all this, this great data during the, the different behaviors, we have to figure out a way to, to simplify it so that we can understand what's going on. So what we have done, first of all, is to look, just look at the trajectories during the different behaviors. So during the times when swimming occurred, this is what the membrane potential of one of those cells looked like. Went up, stayed up. During fall, it went up, came down, went back up again. Right? So, so some, there's overlap, but in fact, there's separation too. So one of the things you can do is just ask, what's the probability that at any given time, um, this a given um, uh, recording is in a swim versus in a crawl? And so what you can, you can look at then over time is what the probability is that these are two separate populations. And what you can see is what, what looks obvious in looking at it is that there's clean separation here, uh, and then they come back together. And then there seems to be somewhat of a separation here. And sure enough, the p-values go from very high down to uh, 001 uh, down here. And they stay low. And then they come back up again when these overlap and go back down. Okay? So, so you, can, you can ask them, uh, where is the separation over this time? You can do this for all the cells that we can record from. And you can then line up which ones have a p-value of uh, uh, less than 0 0.01 uh, at which times. So this is the 10 seconds, uh, the same time period as was looked at here. And you can see that some of them um, become different early. Some of them become different later. Some of them never become different. So some of the cells, half the cells in the ganglion, do the same thing in both behaviors. The other half show a distinction. And that distinction uh, occurs at different times. This green line is when we can tell from the extracellular recordings that there was a difference. That is, that swimming occurred as opposed to, to crawling. And so this is just taking each of these cells and dropping it down to show you when, how many cells are different at which times. Right? So, so the cells that we're most interested in are the ones that show a distinction, but that show the distinction earliest. Because those are the ones that could be involved in making the decision. And so we we asked, when was that earliest distinction made? Well, there are a few cells here that make it quite early. But we wanted to see whether using that, we could find even earlier cells. And so we, we applied a linear discriminant analysis to it. And basically, what that does is to take the trajectory of each of the cells, two at a time. So then you can go to the third, the fourth, the fifth, the 141st cell. And you want to 
on, on this plot of their trajectories of cell one versus cell two, which is shown here, uh, you want to draw a line, linear discriminant uh, number one, which, when you project all of these points onto it, give the best separation. So if you, if you had a line like this, it wouldn't be a very good projection. If you had a line like that, it wouldn't be a good projection. This line separates these two the best. What that allows us to do then is to look at these earlier times. So what we did was to take all of the cells, um, their projections, and look at and, and derive the linear discriminant during the time when they were, when most of the cells were clearly distinctly different during this uh, sort of degree of control. And then you can ask how early you can then take these discriminants and take all the cells and look earlier in time and see whether you can use the threshold for them. And in fact, you can. So you can, you can find earlier times than you can tell from any of the cells by themselves. And then you can ask which cells, which of the 141 cells, 145 cells, um, contributed to the slope of that line. So if the line is, is straight up and down, then that slope doesn't help you discriminate. If it's, uh, if it's at 45 degrees, it'll, it'll give you the, the, the more of the slope, the more of the cell contributes to the discrimination. And so cells like this, or a cell like this, or a cell like that, a cell like that, is contributing a lot to the discrimination. We can then project this back onto the, the um, uh, picture of the ganglion, and we can ask which cells show the best discrimination. And so it could be either negative or positive, depends on whether the, the trajectory is going up or down. Uh, and so the cells that are, that are reddish on this uh, plot are the ones that show the best discrimination. Uh, this does better. These do better uh, at discriminating than any of the cells by themselves. So this red line shows how these cells as a group discriminate, whereas these show how, how individual cells discriminate. I just want to show you that, that taking one of these cells, the, the nice thing about this uh, using these dyes is that you can go through this analysis, the cells are still alive. And uh, you can put an electrode into the cells, and you can go cell by cell and say, that cell looks like it's different. Can I change the activity of the whole system by, by sticking with just that cell? It turns out that the one cell, which by itself will contribute to the behavior, is this one right here. It's called cell 208. And if you, if you give the stimulus this many times, get this, all these different activity patterns, but during that time, you stimulate cell 208 intracellularly. Anytime you depolarize the cell, what you get is crawling. So during the time that the cell is de depolarized, this is a crawling pattern. As soon as the depolarization is off, it started to swim. Sometimes during that, that time, it started to crawl, and then it continued to crawl. Anytime you hyperpolarize the cell, it started to swim right away. So that means that the cell is biasing the behavior. That single cell is biasing the behavior. So what does that mean? How is the decision made? Is it something like this, where we have decision makers that are, that are um, uh, sitting there doing nothing unless the, the, um, they get the right stimulus and they produce the different behavior? Or is it something like this, where all the cells are falling into one or another of these, these attractors? Well, we think, like most dichotomies that you can draw in biology, it's somewhere in between. Uh, we think that what's going on is that there are some decision makers, but they don't turn on just for one behavior. They tend to turn on for several behaviors. And that they fall, the, those decision makers tend to fall into these states. And when they do, um, you get one behavior over another. Okay, so this is the... The list of people, the work that I talked about today mostly was uh, a wonderful graduate student named Kevin Friedman. Um, the dyes that we used were invented by Roger Chen and developed by Theo Gonzalez in his laboratory. Uh, and the analysis that we're working on now is with 